on behalf of the 1,300 students, faculty, and staff here at the Rockefeller College. Um, this, uh, this event that we're having today is actually one of a number that we have been doing about environmental policy between the work that Jennifer's been doing with our new uh, concentration in our EPA program and also some coordinated programming that we're doing in our Institute for Nonprofit Leadership and Community Development. We're pleased to have you here. Um, I'll lose my dean stripes if I don't mention it's not too late to apply for some of the great programs that will address some of these same questions uh, for the fall or even for the summer. Um, but we hope we'll also see you here as we continue to develop our programming and the coursework and curriculum that are addressing really critical issues around climate change and environmental policy. So welcome. I hope you enjoy uh, the event today. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. I also should just thank all for supporting this event and also really seeing the value that we can contribute to the community by sharing information on really important environmental policy issues that are happening. So, as you know, the state legislature is considering a bill right now uh, to amend Article 1 of the state constitution to create an, a right to a clean environment. This is known as a Green Amendment or an Environmental Right Amendment. Today we're going to hear about this from a variety of different perspectives and also put into context what's happening in New York given a much broader movement around creating environmental uh, rights in state constitutions in the U.S. So before I introduce our speakers, I just want to thank a few people, and then I'll introduce everyone in order that they're going to present this afternoon. So I want to thank our staff and our uh, volunteer students who are really making this happen this afternoon and making sure everything went smoothly and getting us started. I want to thank Mary Ellen Malia, who's here from our, um, she's our director of the university's uh, Office of Sustainability. She's really on the forefront of the university's efforts to deal with environmental issues, and she's been very helpful with outreach uh, for this event and helping us with student engagement. And also, Pam Screepak, who couldn't be here today, who is the leader of our nonprofit institute, who's also making a priority of environmental issues from a nonprofit perspective. I also want to thank Peter Wands and his team. They've been very helpful in getting, uh, working with us to create such a great uh, group of people to speak about this issue with you today. So we have a full agenda and a short amount of time, so I'm going to introduce everyone and then we'll jump into the event. So thank you all for coming. I really appreciate seeing you here. I hope you find this really informative as we think about these issues more and more. So Peter Wands is going to kick us off. He's going to explain what the Green Amendment Bill is and give us a brief update of what's going on in the state legislature. He's the Executive Director of Environmental Advocates of New York. He formerly worked with the American Lung Association as the Director of Advocacy and later as the Assistant Vice President. He's also served in many roles in New York State Government as the Acting Commissioner of the Department of Environmental Conservation, as Deputy Secretary for the Environment, and Assistant Secretary of the Environment. And he's going to give us some context for how we should think about this bill. We're also very pleased to have Maya Danrosa here to be our keynote speaker this afternoon. She's the Delaware Riverkeeper and not of the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. Did I say that right? Delaware Riverkeeper. Yes, that's her title. She's also the author of a new book called The Green Amendment, Securing Our Right to a Healthy Environment. This book is based on her experience leading a case in Pennsylvania to strengthen Pennsylvania's environmental right to a clean environment, its environmental right amendment to address issues related to hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling, what we know as fracking. She won this case, which also affirmed the constitutional right in people of Pennsylvania to a clean and healthy environment, so this was a real watershed moment. The book articulates revision for a new environmentalism based on this uh, constitutional right and how this vision, this vision can address some of the serious environmental problems of our time. So she's going to share this vision with us and also help us put into context what's happening in our final three speakers are going to comment on this proposal from different perspectives. Edmund Tiernan is a partner with the law firm Marlin and Porter. You can just let us know who you are so everybody knows. He also formerly served as the Deputy Commissioner and General Counsel of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. As one of the top environmental lawyers in New York, he's going to help us understand the legal implications of this free amendment. We also have David Suarez, who's Senior Director of Government Affairs with the Business Council, doing advocacy for the business community on issues related to energy and the environment. So this is Darren right here. He also formerly worked for Lyndon and Stroud, lobbying for Fortune 500 companies on energy and environmental issues, and previously served as the Program Director for Environmental and Economic Development in the New York State Senate. He's here to share the concerns that the business community has with this free amendment so we can also understand that perspective. And on his way is Merton Simpson. 
go to a right side of the gaming section, which is the right to host and play music channel. Bingo! Yeah, you know, and I don't want to be flippant about it, but I mean, that's the level of detail sometimes that the Constitution gets into because the gaming is a constitutional So, box of men, they go this, go home tonight, look at the Bill of Rights, fact checking this thing. I wouldn't say it if it was. So, we have these conversations at some point. About it in a serious case of adding a constitutional right, but that's sort of the juxtaposition out there for many of these communities. Um, and other communities sort of you know struggle with their quality issues and others. So um, we decided to present the legislature with some legislation. And uh, two years ago, the New York State Assembly and the Senate printed this bill. The, the State Assembly got a vote on it that had a broad bipartisan coalition of members in the Assembly that supported it. It was not brought up in the last two years by that Senate leadership. Uh, it was, you know, held in committee for consideration. But this year, it was a different Senate leadership, different details. They moved the bill very early, and it sits on the Senate floor. And it is just one committee away from the Assembly floor as well. And there's a high likelihood that that bill will come up next week when they debate the Earth Day agenda. Um, so we could have, a week from today, two houses voting the first time to give first passage to this constitutional amendment in this process. Uh, but that's the way it's sort of is, is leading towards. The next step is the bill has to come up for second passage, and you have to wait for an ensuing election to install a new legislature to then vote the second time um, for this constitutional amendment. So it's not two years, it's two legislatures, and legislatures sit for two years. So we have to wait until the 2020 election have a new legislature installed, and then the same bill can be brought up. And it's passed again in the second passage by both the Senate and the Assembly. Then it will be presented to the voters of the ballot. So the earliest this amendment can appear on the ballot is 2021. So that is kind of the plot. That's really it. I'm not here to editorialize too much more on the bill itself. If you want, you can go to our webpage <coughs> and find a bill on the bill. We at Environmental Advocates give ratings to bills that are great, one, two, or three trees. We don't like them, one, two, or three stacks. Yes, we're told sometimes where to put our stacks. That's the nature of the political environment. Um, so you can go to our website and look for bill memos and read more about the bill itself and our perspective on it. Um, and I'll just wrap up by just saying once again, thanks for being here. I'm really excited that we've got uh, Darren Suarez from Business Council and Interior who's now um, in private practice with a former general counsel. Give us a round of experience, and of course, Merce Simpson, who, um, if you don't know, and I know that we'll talk about it, they're working really hard on this sort of really interesting environmental justice issue in the Sheridan Hall, and there's some of you that we're working on too. It's about the energy system that powers the state capital. Should it be based on fossil fuels, or should we once and for all look at our central nervous system of state government and power that by renewable energy? He and others are leading this fight to move away from being based on fossil fuels for the renewables. Um, organizationally, we're totally supportive of working with them, but it's really a courageous effort to essentially move the whole energy system for the state off its complex down to the plaza in the capital onto renewable energy systems. Um, the fitting of a state that would inspire a true climate. Change. So, um, not here, but I want to give a that fine word. It plays into sort of the ecosystem of what's behind. I will now turn it over to Maya to run through the presentation. I think afterwards, then, I don't know if you've got the order. Yes, we'll work out for this one here. Yeah, we're going to go with Edge, and then Merton, and then Jeremy. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, well, we have a problem. We have a problem with presentation. I didn't tell Edge. I'm 
States of America, when you look at the local level, the state level, and the federal level, we have very literally hundreds of thousands of environmental protection laws in place. And as each of these laws has been passed, and as each of these laws has been implemented, it is important to recognize that they have accomplished a degree of benefit and protection when it comes to the environment. They have reduced pollution, they have prevented illness, they have created jobs and protected communities from the ravages of droughts and floods and wildfires. But they've only done it to a certain extent. And that's because all of the laws here in the United States of America are written in a way that accepts pollution and degradation as a foregone conclusion, a necessary evil, something we must expect and accept. Um, and as a result, they seek to manage this pollution or, um, and degradation to a certain degree, but beyond that, it becomes about permitting the how, the when, the where it's going to take place. And so as a result, as a result, right, we do have pollution, we do have degradation, we do have the take of species that is happening day in and day out in states across the nation. Not despite, but because of this system of environmental laws that we have in place. And so as a result, we have communities across the nation that are being harmed by pollution and degradation. We have communities like the community of Polesboro and the community of Hoosick Falls that find their drinking water contaminated with a dangerous family of chemicals known as perfluorinated chemicals, or PFCs for short. PFCs have very serious health consequences for those who have the misfortune of coming into contact with them, let alone drinking them in their drinking water year in and year out for decades unbeknownst to them. PFCs cause cancer, they cause birth defects, and more. And PFCs have gotten into our environment over the years through the very legal use by Army, the Navy, and industry. <coughs> now, despite all of these environmental protection laws we have in place, we have families like the Stauffer family that find themselves living next to a highly contaminated site, a site which, as I describe it, is super saturated with dangerous contaminants, particularly when it comes to this Bishop tube site, something known as trichloroethylene, TCE. TCE, like PSEs, has very serious health consequences for those who have the misfortune of coming into contact with it. Now, despite the fact that the government has known that this site has been super saturated with TCE and other toxins for about 30 years now, there has been no meaningful effort to clean this site up. And as a result, the contamination plume has been allowed to spread more than a mile away, taking the TCE to new communities and to new environments. This happens despite the fact that we have all of these environmental protection laws in place. We have communities like the community of Minnesota, who in recent years found that they were about to have a fracked gas compressor station built right in the heart of their rural community. Now, the people of Minnesota didn't want this fracked gas compressor station built in their community because fracked gas compressor stations of this kind are known to be a serious source of hazardous air pollutants. And it is known that those who have the misfortune of living next to fracked gas compressor stations of this kind suffer very serious health consequences. Despite the fact that we have all of these environmental protection laws in place, despite the fact that we know all of this about fracked gas compressor stations, despite the fact that the people of Minnesota got themselves organized and opposed the construction of this compressor station, today it operates right in the heart of their rural community. And if you go to Minnesota and you ask them about their experiences, they will tell you about how their, qual their quality of life has been harmed by the operation of this facility. They will tell you how their property values have suffered. They will tell you how their health has suffered since this compressor station was built and went into operation. We have communities across the nation that are increasingly suffering the ravages of climate change. <laughs> whether you're talking about droughts or floods or wildfires. We have minority communities that continue to be unfairly targeted for highly polluting activities and operations. Minority communities have a much higher rate of exposure as a result to dangerous contaminants, whether you're talking about the air or the water or the soil. And in fact, minority children don't have to wait to be born to have a higher rate of exposure to dangerous contaminants, to dangerous toxins. Toxins that will impact
of people. This is one of the few Atlantic sturgeons that's born in the Delaware River today. The Delaware River is actually a home to a genetically unique population of Atlantic sturgeon that exists nowhere else on Earth, nowhere, but in our beautiful Delaware River. At this point, we have less than 300 spawning adults left. And despite all of these environmental protection laws we have in place, I still have to week in and week out in my role as the Delaware Riverkeeper, battle against new threats and ongoing threats that are very literally putting this genetically unique population on the death block. And all of this is happening, and so much more, despite the fact that we have all of these environmental protection laws in place. And when I go into communities, when Peter goes into when all the environmental advocates in this room go into communities that are facing these horrible threats to their environment, to their health, to their safety, to, to their families, and to their lives, they inevitably all have the same question. Sometimes they ask the question with their words, and sometimes they ask it with their body language as they sit with slumped shoulders in the back of the room, overwhelmed by what they're learning about this terrible threat that's about to come barreling down. And the question is why? Why? Why is it that we are facing this dangerous threat to our environment, our health, and our communities? Don't we as people here on this earth, don't we have a right to clean water and clean air and a healthy environment? Isn't that our right by virtue of the fact that we are people here on this earth? And I have the misfortune of having to tell them at those meetings, no, you don't. You have a right to all sorts of things here in the United States of America. You have a right to free speech and freedom of religion. You have due process rights. You have private property rights. You have gun rights. In many states, you have the right to get divorced. As Peter told you, here in the state of New York, you have a right to play bingo. <laughs> but in states across the nation, you do not have a right to a healthy environment. Except with very limited exceptions. Actually, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, you have all of those other political, human, and civil rights that we hold dear and learn about throughout the entirety of our lives. And you have a constitutionally recognized and protected right to pure water, clean air, and a healthy environment. And so people very quickly ask me, how is it possible that the people of Pennsylvania have this constitutional right when we in other states across the nation do not. If you look at Pennsylvania's history, it is just as rich in exploitation of our natural resources as every other state across the nation. They allow just as much pollution to be spewed into the air, just as much pollution to be spewed into the water. They allow just as many industrial operations to overwhelm Pennsylvania communities. So what is it that the people of Pennsylvania have that was different than every other community in every other state across the nation. Well, the people of Pennsylvania had this gentleman. His name is Franklin Curry. Franklin Curry got elected to the Pennsylvania legislature in the late 1960s. And he very quickly realized that one of the reasons why Pennsylvania's environment was allowed to become so degraded that it was harming every aspect of the lives of the people of Pennsylvania was because we were not recognizing and protecting the inalienable <coughs> right to a healthy environment in the same way we were recognizing and protecting all of those other inalienable human, civil, and political rights we hold dear. And so Franklin Curry proposed to change that. And he proposed that an amendment be added to the Pennsylvania Constitution. An amendment that would be added to the Bill of Rights section and would in fact recognize and protect the inalienable right to pure water, clean air, and a healthy environment. And recognize the duty of all government officials to protect those rights for all the people of Pennsylvania. When this provision went before the House of Representatives in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in 1971, it passed unanimously. And when it went before the Senate, it passed unanimously. And when it went before the people of Pennsylvania, it passed overwhelmingly by a vote of 4 to 1. And so in 1971, the people of Pennsylvania had a constitutional right to a healthy environment. And so you would have thought, you would have thought from that moment on, environmental protection in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania would have been so much better than 
it was in every other state across the nation. But if you know anything about this, <laughs> you know that that was not to be the story. And that wasn't to be the story for Pennsylvania, because very early on, there was an incredible overreach, frankly, a misuse of how folks sought to use this newly minted constitutional right. And long story short, I won't go into the ins and outs of that, but long story short, um, we got decisions out of the Pennsylvania courts, including the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, which as the Chief Justice at the time described it, emasculated, disemboweled the newly minted constitutional right, declared it to be good public policy, but not to have the same legal strength as every other provision in the Bill of Rights section of the Pennsylvania Constitution. And so that's the way things stood in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for 42 years. For 42 years, you had this great language in the Constitution. But nothing had really changed under the law for the people of Pennsylvania. Fast forward to the mid-2000s. Enter drilling and fracking, coming to Pennsylvania communities, bringing with it all of its highly polluting industrial operations, bringing with it tremendous land transformation and deforestation and devastation of the natural resources and habitats of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, bringing with it the creation of massive volumes of highly toxic frack wastewater, wastewater so toxic that even the industry doesn't have good solutions for what to do with it, except solutions which create problems for others, like earthquakes in Oklahoma. It brought with it water pollution, Pollution of our rivers and our streams and our groundwater and even people's drinking water supplies. It brought with it the release of hazardous air pollutants of all kinds, including climate changing emissions. And it brought with it the proliferation of infrastructure, pipelines and compressor stations and more. And given the state of the law in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, it was really pretty easy for the fracking industry to overwhelm Pennsylvania's communities and natural resources with their polluting industrial operations. But the way I experienced it, and the way I describe it, is that for the, for the industry themselves, for the people representing that industry, it just wasn't easy enough. They wanted to find a way to make it even easier for themselves. So very, very literally, leaders from the fracking industry got together and went behind closed doors and wrote for themselves a piece of legislation. A piece of legislation that was passed by the legislature and signed by the governor in 2012. A piece of legislation that came to be known as Act 13. Now, Act 13 was a very literal gift basket to the industry. Of course it was. The industry wrote it for themselves. Um, and Act 13 did a lot of bad things. For example, it gave the industry the power of eminent domain to force the storage of gas, highly explosive gas, under people's properties, whether or not they wanted it there. They put in place automatic waivers for important environmental protections. They mandated that drilling and fracking operations be allowed to happen in every part of every community in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, including in the heart of the residential communities. And it did more. And it did more. So the fact of the matter is, despite how bad it already was for the people of Pennsylvania in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, or despite how bad it was for the people of Pennsylvania when it came to drilling and fracking, it was about to get a whole lot worse. A whole lot worse. Now, we at the Delaware Riverkeeper Network knew, quickly, we had to find a way to take on Act 13. We had to find a way to defeat this devastating law. But the problem is, how do you defeat a piece of legislation passed by the legislature and signed by the governor? What can you do? You can try to get the legislature to repeal the law. That chance that was happening in Pennsylvania. Or you can find a higher power, some greater authority. And we realized at the Delaware Riverkeeper Network that we may be in this moment in time when we could use the greater authority of the Pennsylvania Constitution to actually successfully challenge the provisions of Act 13 that were so alarming to us. And so we teamed up with seven towns and a physician to challenge Act 13. And each of us brought our own arguments to the table. But the argument that the Delaware Riverkeeper Network brought to this effort through our attorneys was that the provisions of Act 13 that we were challenging were unconstitutional because they violated, they violated the 
environmental rights of the people of Pennsylvania. Now the case went all the way up to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, a very conservative Supreme Court at the time, with a very conservative Supreme Court Chief Justice. And despite that, December 19th of 2013, we got an amazing victory out of that Supreme Court. A victory that was actually written, the plurality opinion was actually written by that conservative Chief Justice. And I want you to read with me a few of the things that Chief Justice Castile wrote in the opinion that he delivered on that fateful day in December 2013. By any responsible account, the exploitation of the Marcellus Shale Formation, drilling and fracking, will produce a detrimental effect on the environment, on the people, their children, and future generations. That the natural resources that were being harmed were resources essential to life, to health, and to liberty. And that as a result, the provisions of Act 13 that we were challenging were unconstitutional because they violated the environmental rights of the people of Pennsylvania. And in that moment, with that victory, we not only defeated some of the most devastating aspects of Act 13, but we very literally breathed legal life back into that long ignored Green Amendment and restored to the people of Pennsylvania their constitutional right to pure water, clean air, and a healthy environment. <laughs> and in his opinion, Chief Justice Castile made a very, very important point to the people of Pennsylvania, besides doing all that other good stuff and making all those other good points. He made very clear to the people of Pennsylvania that their right to a healthy environment was not given to them by Article 1, Section 27 of the Pennsylvania Constitution. That these are inalienable, inherent, indefeasible rights that they already had by virtue of the fact that they were people here on this earth. But because of Pennsylvania's Green Amendment, these rights were given the highest level of legal recognition and protection you can get here in the United States of America. Bill of Rights level recognition and protection. Now since we had that victory in 2013, we at the Delaware Riverkeeper Network and others recognizing the importance of this victory have been doing the work of defining what it actually means to have a constitutional right to a healthy environment and then defending that right. Right? Because it's not instantly clear. You don't instantly know what it means to have this constitutional right. If you think about the rights of free speech and freedom of religion and other fundamental freedoms, we've had those for hundreds of years. And yet we're still to this day, at key points in time, litigating and advocating over what they mean. Well, when it comes to environmental rights, we're just at the beginning of that journey. Right? But we're making a lot of really important progress in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania beyond our Act 13 victory. But also, in the wake of this victory, as we've been doing this work to define and defend environmental rights in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, I realized that in this victory, there was something more than just for the people of Pennsylvania. There was a message for all communities in all states across our nation. The message that our rights to pure water, clean air, and healthy environment are inalienable, inherent, indefeasible rights that belong to us by virtue of the fact that we are people here on this earth. That these are rights that are worthy, worthy of constitutional recognition and protection. And that we communities across the nation need to rise up together, rise up together and demand and defend our environmental rights. And I believe that the best way that we can do that is to rise up together with what I call a Green Amendment movement. A movement to go to every single state in the United States of America and seek and secure the passage of a Green Amendment like the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has. And why do we need a Green Amendment movement? Why do we need a movement? We need a movement because there are only two states that have a Green Amendment. Pennsylvania and Montana. That's it. We have a lot of states that talk about the environment in their constitutions. Right? But to the extent that they're in the Bill of Rights section, they talk about things like fishing, hunting, and trapping rights, or the right to navigate waterways. They don't talk about the right to clean water, clean air, and a healthy environment. Or, if they're placed somewhere else in the Constitution, not in the Bill of Rights section, they do talk about the right to clean water, clean air, and a healthy environment. But then they begin 
or end the sentence with, and that's good public policy, instantly robbing it of its legal strength. Or they begin or end the sentence by saying, and the way you get these rights is your state passes laws to protect the environment. Well, that's the situation we're in now, so it doesn't really change anything. And most importantly, most importantly, they don't recognize the right to clean water, clean air, and a healthy environment as an inalienable right in the Bill of Rights section of the Constitution that is self-executing and to be protected on par with all those other political, human, and civil rights that we hold to. And I just want to acknowledge, of course, in the U.S. Constitution, we don't have green in that Now, what does New York have? I'm sure many of you know, if not all of you know, that New York has a lot of language. <laughs> decision 
decision-making. You don't hop to management. Government officials are duty-bound. If they are going to be able to defend their decisions in court, they are going to be duty-bound to demonstrate that they look at the facts and the impacts of their decisions and actions before they took them. They are duty-bound to show that they actually looked at their science and use that science to inform their decision before they made it. No one after the fact rationalizations. Government officials must show when they're engaged in their decision making, they must show that they considered how they could um, pursue their goal, whether it's energy creation or development or economic advancement, how they pursued that goal in a way that would protect the environment at the same time, at the same time. Environmental justice is strengthened when you have a Green Amendment, because every single individual in the state has the same constitutional right to a healthy environment. And therefore, government officials are duty-bound, duty-bound, to treat all of us equitably, regardless of the color of our skin, regardless of our income level, regardless of where we live, regardless of our physical and mental capacities. We all have the same right. We must all be treated and protected equitably by our government. People in the state have a changed expectation when they speak with their legislators and decision makers. No longer, do, no longer do we go into our meetings hoping our government officials will do the right thing when it comes to the environment. We now go in expecting them to do the right thing. You stand straighter. You use firmer language. And when they give you the wrong answer, you don't sit down and shut up because you know that you are defending your constitutional right. So you are firmer, you are more dogged in your pursuit of equity and fairness and protection. Environmental advocates, they're no longer just dismissed as tree huggers and fish lovers, or job killers and people haters, or environmental terrorists, or eco-jihadists. We are now recognized for what we truly are. We are recognized for being the true U.S. patriots that we are. U.S. patriots who are rising up to defend a constitutional right. And here in the United States of America, if you are rising up to defend the Constitution, that's the way people think about you, whether they agree with you or disagree with you. So there's so much more power in this for the people as well. Fundamentally, the goal of Green Amendment is to secure better decisions on the front end. Advance the good and prevent the bad. But when government officials get it wrong, a Green Amendment gives you immediate access to the courts to vindicate your constitutional right to a healthy environment. Now we are working hard through the Green Amendment movement to spread this message right, to every audience, to every community, and every state across the nation, including into the classroom. So if there are any teachers in this room, there's a free teacher guide and student guide that you can grab a hold of to help start this conversation with the younger, younger generation. And I hope at this point, with all of this, that I've sort of taken you with me on my journey to recognize that there is something wrong with our current system of environmental protection, <coughs> that it is fundamentally failing us, but that there is another path that we can embark upon, a path that will give us powerful and beneficial, beneficial and uh, protection for present and future generations, which is what we all need. And the path is the passage of Green Amendments. And let's start here in the state of New York. Let's make New York the modern day leader of the Green Amendment movement. We can if we pass the New York Green Amendment. Thank you.
Um, first of all, so the New York State Constitution, many people would, would describe as a highly technical legal term, a mess. Okay? <laughs> it is very thin, very thin, very long. We're mainly talking about Article 1. Article 1 is the New York State Bill of Rights. And Peter's absolutely right. It has, in some places, some relatively precise descriptions. Uh, workers' compensation, for example, is, is Section 18 of Article 1. Uh, it seems strange that, that something that's more involved in a statutory uh, construct would find its way into a bill of rights, but that's the way it is in New York. Article 14 is perhaps the most famous environmental provision in the New York State Constitution. It contains the four of the wild forms, okay, protecting the Adirondacks and Catskills and the other preserved areas. Uh, Article 19 is where we want to focus our attention tonight. Article 19 is how you amend the New York State Constitution. And there are basically two ways, uh, and I'm going to try and describe them to you briefly, I know some of, uh, some of the things Peter said, uh, and um, then give you perhaps two case studies that might, might inform our thinking in this area. Okay? First, New York is relatively unique, a highly Jeffersonian view of the world, Every 20 years in New York, there's a call for a constitutional convention. Should we convene a set of conventioneers who will have the opportunity to rewrite the Constitution? Indeed, that's exactly what happened uh, in 1894 when Article 14 for a wild provision found its way into the New York Constitution. Okay? Um, it also happened again in 1967. Constitutional Convention that was adopted, a constitution was put forth and then rejected by the people of the state of New York. Okay? How does the constitution get reformed? How does it reform the constitution by convention? Peter described it, right? Um, two separate legislatures have to adopt the, I'm sorry, I'm confused myself. Okay? The constitutional Convention gets convened, the conveners have carte blanche. <coughs> to reconsider a number of issues. Uh, and there was a great concern when our Constitutional Convention cycle came up two years ago that perhaps it was not the right time, uh, given the polarized environment we find ourselves in, to convene a Constitutional Convention. Um, I know that there were many groups uh, uh, on environmental issues who thought that perhaps the for a while provision of Article 14 might be at risk. And support for the Constitutional Convention ultimately dissipated and at the referendum level. The state, the people of the state of New York decided the Constitutional Convention would not be the way to go. Okay? So if you can't have a convention where you take the whole Constitution or parts thereof and, and rewrite it, how do you amend the Constitution? Article 19 tells us the unique process in New York, two separate legislatures have to adopt your bill if you want to amend the provision of the Constitution. And as Peter correctly pointed out, that's not two votes, two legislative sessions. That's a newly elected legislature in between the two events, okay? So the bill gets introduced in a normal way, goes to a committee, has a hearing, passes one uh, house, and then perhaps the other house, and has to wait until there is a, it gets referred, essentially, to the next legislature to do the same thing. There's an interesting little sidestep in there at some point, the Attorney General is supposed to provide an opinion letter to the legislature who then is supposed to consider the Attorney General's um, opinion and perhaps rewrite the legislation. Uh, at my time at DEC, we successfully amended Article 14 twice in this regard, using this practice, um, um, to adjust certain boundaries in, in, in the Adirondacks and to make other accommodations. Uh, so it is possible, it is a workable solution, not especially efficient, but certainly more efficient than a constitutional convention, okay? Um, I think I mentioned that there are two examples, and I alluded to the first one, the Forever Wild Commission, the popular Article 14. There is often lost in um, the discussion of New York State, Article 14 includes a conservation bill of rights, okay? It is um, a declaration of state policy of the people of New York to preserve clean air, clean water, and um, other environmental um, priorities. My 
correctly described the two ways that constitutional amendments work. One is legislative, and the second is often referred to as self-executing. And I believe when you said there were two states, you meant two with self-executing environmental provisions, but people often talk about six or seven states having environmental bill of rights. But um, the New York current conservation bill of rights um, is very much legislative, calls for legislative action. Okay? And even though it was part of the 1967 convention, it was rejected by the voters. It was adopted in the two-step process that we just spoke about. Unfortunately, it shows, I believe, the downside of using the Constitution to affect social change. The Conservation Bill of Rights in New York is almost universally described as a relic, an unused constitutional provision. And just like the 42 years it took in Pennsylvania for the right case to come along to vindicate that rights, that hasn't happened under the current Article 14. So um, that's the second problem or challenge to using constitutional rights to protect environmental policy and prevents programs. It's dependent upon the individual. And Peter is exactly right. It takes at least two cycles, two legislative cycles. We could not adopt the Green Amendment in New York until 2021. Add the 42 years on top of that, and we should wait until 2063 for the benefits that we work so hard for today. Um, the other thing is you are transferring decision making authority from an executive agency and a chief executive, answerable to the people at a much time, to a judiciary that is quote unquote independent and can make policy decisions that you might not anticipate. Um, do we, can we presently predict today that all the things we believe are very important to key issues on environmental policy, will they always be seen as helpful? Is it possible that a court could decide that having a solar field in your neighborhood is not helpful? Or even advance environmental policy that wind energy is seen as somehow infringing upon someone's right to a clean environment? These are things that one state become constitutional are much harder to, to anticipate and sometimes to rectify. That's precisely why I noticed the comment rulemaking at the executive agencies level is you know, often a method used for complex technical problems. Um, so I just want to uh, point out um, one final thing. There's no question, no question that there are many challenges Despite, despite um, environmental legislation that has been adopted in New York. It's no uh, coincidence that the 1967 convention, which gave rise to the 1969 Conservation Bill of Rights, found what preceded, or two years later, we have a title of legislation in New York. The Environmental Conservation Law was totally rewritten. The Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the uh, Fresh Water and Final Wetlands Act, all ushered in, remarkably, by Republican governor, Nelson Rockefeller, who worked that all the way through the process. Each one of those statutes has given rise to, I would submit, many, many, many environmental benefits. Not absolute, that's for sure, but immediate, available, and malleable. You can be used to meet the challenges of today. Okay? There is no question, I agree with my completely. Um, environmental justice, clean water, and uh, paramount importance of climate change are the challenges we, we face in environmental policy today. The real question, though, is is a constitutional amendment really the way to go? And I, I hate to do this to Peter, but I have to go back to the zinger on Bingo. I really wonder whether bingo is any safer in New York because it's enshrined in the Bill of Rights. I play bingo in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, it all seems pretty much like the same game. So um, I just close with that. It, it is this a problem or an idea that science may be already passed given the superstructure of the environmental statutes and programs that we have to the executive agencies. And it's not just for New York. So my perspective. Is that a microphone? No. Oh.
I apologize for one of those who are suffering from uh, our recent surgery. But um, this is really important uh, for me to be here. Yesterday, I went to the Capitol with a group of Skidmore students. Uh, we're working in a global consortium to deal with environmental justice. <coughs> and uh, we delivered 1,250 signatures asking the government to support 100% renewable energy. Um, and I was feeling a little faint yesterday, but I said I really have to be here today because uh, as I look at it, even if we had a global commitment today to do everything right, we might not be able to preserve the planet for our future generations. Um, I think you just have to look at the recent developments in Washington to know that the gap between law and enforcement of law is vast. Um, having said that, it's crucial that we have all of these tools and our arsenal available to make the law as potent as it can be. Um, I first became very active in August of 2017 uh, when we found out that the governor had proposed the installation of two frack gas uh, turbines at 79 Sheridan Avenue. It's about five blocks from where I actually live. But having been a social justice activist since 1968, and now being a county legislator, there's nothing more important than the preservation of our planet. And the fact that our response is so inadequate to the challenge that we have is really frightening to me. Um, climate challenge has become the topic agenda item for me as an elected official. And it's difficult because of the present environment that we live in. People are so mired down in daily survival that they don't have the luxury of actually understanding the long-term implications of what's done in our name. The governor has a lot of lofty pronouncements about his goals. And yet, to be the capital of New York State and to propose a natural gas frack power plant in a facility that since 1911 has subjected an environmental justice community to high levels of toxins. From 1981 to 1994, the ANSYS plant has caused a very, very statistically significant occurrence of cancer to people who live in proximity to that facility. I know literally dozens of families where multiple members have exotic forms of cancer. In fact, we have reason to believe that my wife's sister died from multiple myeloma from exposure to the toxins that came out of burning trash between 1981 and 1994. And so when you consider that history, the idea that now the governor who claims to be an advocate for environmental progress were proposed to something this draconian is really mind-boggling. And this one step forward, three steps back, is not, is not going to give us a sustainable plan. It's my personal belief in terms of the interaction that I've had with government decision-makers from OGS, the New York Power Authority, and NYSERDA, that there are certain key people who, if left to their own devices, would actually move us more strongly in the right direction. The stumbling block seems to be with the chief executive officer. If the governor wanted to, he could advance us in the, the level of seriousness that's required. And it's a mystery to me why somebody who has clearly as intelligent as he is 
hasn't done the cost-benefit analysis that going green is not only necessary for survival, but it's also economically viable. There's $88 million allocated for this frack gas power plant. That $88 million could go a long way to doing geothermal energy for fueling the whole 98-acre Empire State Plaza. So share basically has a dual goal. We want to relieve the burden of toxicity for the residents of Sheridan Hollow. But more importantly, we want New York State to be the leader in environmental justice that it should be. Most people in this country live in either New York State or California. So if New York State does the right thing, and locally, their examples are really positive things that are going on. Skidmore College has a very significant commitment to geothermal energy. I think just a few days ago, the head of my server, Alicia Barton, announced the opening of a net zero facility around it. Uh, and I believe if she was supported, we would go a lot further. So I, I'm not sure what level of advocacy we have to enact to move the governor to match his action with his rhetoric. But I know that we have to do everything possible to get there because our children deserve it. Um, again, when we first, in August uh, 2017, were made aware, uh, the New York Power Authority had on their website that they had looked at all of the environmental sustainable options. They looked at where they looked at solar, they looked at geothermal, and they had no excuses for why it wasn't practical. But we did a freedom of information request to get the data upon which they made the decision. They said that they really didn't have any information responsive to that request. So in other words, they were just lying. They were just going to a truck. And you know, we can't afford that. It's too late in the game. Through the work of environmental advocates, share, and a number of other organizations in this state, we have slightly moved the dial, but we're too, too far from the necessary infrastructure for sustainability to be able to make it. And so I think it's a necessary but not sufficient to have an environmental bill of rights, to have a climate community protection act, to have a new green deal. All of that is good and needs to be enforced. Part of that enforcement, of course, is who the decision makers are. And I can only pray that the Democrats get their act together so that we can get the leadership on a national level to, to move us in the direction that we need to go, because this is a global challenge. Um, and I think the significance of what we're doing in Sherry Hollow is important because there's two options. We need to get the governor to make the state capital the model it should be because the balance of state is in play. You know, right now, there are pipelines being proposed to go through Rensselaer. Somebody told me there's some uh, the, uh, fossil fuel infrastructure being developed right around Albany Medical Center. And around the state, there are all kinds of seminars to finance fossil fuel microgrids. And so it doesn't matter that we have a model of sustainability at the Bloomberg Center at Roosevelt Island, or that Cornell Ithaca is doing marvelous things for geothermal. If, on the other hand, we have fossil fuel plants all over the state, pipelines, we pipe in natural gas from Pennsylvania, even though we ban crack gas in New York. This is not a New York State versus planet issue. There's only one planet. There's only one environment. And this parochial chauvinism is not going to sustain us. So I know I'm preaching to everybody here, but I think we have to do everything that we can to make sure that all of the legal supports in place. And then the other more important part is to fight for leadership that's going to do what's appropriate for a sustainable planet. And I think that's about 10 minutes. <laughs>
Give me use my card. This is not what we intended, right? 
because it doesn't work out that way. There is a real ramification of how these things get put in place, what self-executing rights have. But honestly, if I had a choice between dealing with the coal ash that I have in Pennsylvania or this in Montana, which are the two that have self-executing rights, I'll take New York any day. And so the point being is these states don't guarantee just because you put it in paper, put it on that, that you're going to guarantee that right. What we need to know is with some certainty what's going to happen. Enforceable rights uh, themselves uh, don't provide basically. And there's basically no commonly held or single individual perception of what actually constitutes a clean and healthy environment. I only have five minutes, so. And I have 35 more slides. So, <laughs> So I'll go real fast. So I think what we want to do is, while individual rights are, are, are remaining enforceable against a government actor, enforcement against, basically, against other individuals proves to be problematic. And this is what is the real issue. When you have, basically, private, private individuals suing other private individuals for an inherent dep deprivation of that right, it becomes consistently messy. And it's going to be messy because of the way that both the courts will interpret it and because of the actions that basically we'll see. The first, the first time that the Pennsylvania statute was actually challenged, it was challenged because somebody wanted to put up a, a visual tower, a tower so they could see the Gettysburg uh, location. And it was neighbors that were concerned. And those neighbors are pesky. They're everywhere. And guess what? They're going to utilize this statute to inter determine what helpful is for them, and in many cases, it may not be for you, and quite honestly, historically, it hasn't served underserved people as well at all. So there are numerous remedies that are currently available. It's certainly it's well known and documented. As I had basically indicated, the common law protections this allows for individuals with there's a nuisance or others to sue and to defend it receive uh, compensation if something wrong has happened, there's toxic tort, which specifically is in New York State allowing for individuals to recover damages when they've been aggrieved. This is exactly what in these circumstances is what's happening in Hoosick right now. And in Hoosick, what is happening is that people have gone to court, they're seeking those remedies, they already know that they've been aggrieved, and they're seeking basically compensation. The environmental laws also exist, There's, there, and they establish both the regulations. And in addition, in terms of numerous remedies, something the Environmental Bill of Rights never provides you, which is an environmental crime. This is when somebody has done something so egregious, they quite honestly, they deserve to go to jail, they need to go to prison. Those things can only occur in the context of a law. You cannot create a state right that basically ensures that somebody else goes to prison. So this is a distraction from actually what we really need to be doing, which is, as we have sort of been addressed already, there are real environmental problems and issues. The biggest at this point in time being climate change. There is, we need to basically have a system in place where we're addressing those concerns. Our concern is that creating a constitutional tort as a remedy for the violation of the right to clean and healthy environment will result in the removal of predictability in the field of environment and economic industrial policy and regulations that make it more difficult to drive investments in areas that are economically challenged. Don't believe me, look at the world in terms of brownfields. Brown, up until uh, 2003, New York State basically was governed by a situation where uh, brownfields weren't getting redeveloped. They were primarily in urban, underserved communities. They were basically sites that had contamination on them. Individuals wouldn't access those sites because they were worried and concerned about the continuous liability. That liability was only basically they were concerned about the liability system of the state. When you add an environmental bill of rights, the concerns will be greater. Nobody will touch those properties. Now, going back to Hoosick, I would say nobody would have bought that facility when Honeywell basically sold the facility to San Bain. There wouldn't have been a buyer. Whether or not you understand that or comprehend it now, that's exactly what would happen. Nobody would make the investment. There wouldn't be a company there. There is now, you, there's somebody who hold the liable for it. It is something to understand. It's important, too, to understand how businesses 
seek to, uh, they want certainty so that they can avoid problems with basically additional litigation. They also, the perception that they're uh, polluting the environment, they don't want to be polluting the environment, they want to be consistent with what obligations they have. But when you have open ended obligations, they don't know exactly how they're going to come into compliance. But they will avoid it like a plague. There are, in truth, bad actors. We cannot fix bad actors with an environmental bill of rights that had to wrap up. And because the real reason is bad actors don't think they're going to get caught. These are individuals that are spilling at night, they're doing things that are inconsistent, they don't have anything that you're ultimately going to go after. They are truly, ultimately, need uh, crime, uh, criminal issues to get them. I think it's important that we start to understand our environmental issues are changing uh, forever. I mean, with <laughs> <laughs> um, I could you not, I had to be so. <laughs> it's just, I had to, uh, so just important is that the, the important thing I think to remember is that. And the other things I wanted to touch upon was that there are certainly cases where already where individuals, whether or not they're opposing homeless shelters, whether or not they're opposing windmills, they're already using the Article 78 proceeding, the Article 10 proceedings to stop us from getting what society has deemed that they want. They want homeless people to have a place to live, they want to have a clean and healthy environment and clean energy, and already people are utilizing those powers in a way stop those, those things from occurring. If you allow this to go forward, they will utilize it again in that way. So I think it's important to understand that uh, it may not be, it may be impossible to actually implement. It's not going to be a deterrent. It's going to be, it's going to be dependent on how the courts interpret these things. And they're not well situated to understand the science behind individual contaminants, individual levels of exposure, making a real determination as to whether or not health includes yoga or not yoga. And they are honestly, their environmental, our environmental views change over a period of time. And it's right for abuse. We've seen this time and time again where corporations or others have utilized basically up uh, the supports to basically stop or impede other people's actions. And it will discourage investments. That's okay, great. Thank you, everyone. So, our speakers are dying to get uh, a chance to actually respond, but what I'd like to do is open up the conversation for questions and answers. We are actually right at 6 o'clock, so if anyone needs to go, feel free. Can I ask, is, does anyone need to go, or do you want to see Rock or Cole? Yeah, it's okay? All right. Um, so I'm going to gather a couple of questions and then give a chance for our panelists to respond. We'll at least do one round and then see if we might be able to do another depending on time. So any questions or comments? Yes. Yeah, um, it seems to me that environmental law in New York City, um, I mean, we have some of the most powerful laws. We're the first state to um, protect massive amounts of our land and to reforest and we're considered a good success story. But in terms of protecting human health, I think we're a massive failure. I mean, they say that if you want to murder someone, make sure you make a lot of money doing it because it's never going to be that long. And that's why industry gets away with raising the mortality rate around them. And we, in the North industrial northeast, we have put up with that for hundreds of years. We think it's just fine. It's okay if the cancer rate goes away, I don't want to die. And we know it's because of the oil refineries in, in New Jersey. That's fine. We expect that. And um, so there's there's a problem with environmental law. There are not environmental criminal proceedings the way there ought to be. If there were, a lot of people would be in jail. A lot of very rich people would be in jail. And so, so we're, we have this hole, you know, this hole of accountability. And it seems to me, like I'm not sure that this, this amendment, how, how I think it would play out in the courts, how effective it would be. But what I do know is that when there's a problem with environmental law, when we can't get the environmental law to work, when the remedies are so weak that people, I mean, in FIFA in particular, they violate the law and it's and it's worth enough that they make so much money violating the law, they pay the fines, they don't care, right? So, 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 so they basically, it's ineffective, and what we do is we go to court. And that's what you do in the environmental world when, when the regulatory um, mechanisms aren't working. 
When we go to court, we're just looking for laws to sue under. And this would be another set of laws to seek remedy um, civil and, and other remedies at court. And I think more remedies are good. It might be worth some effort to try to get this passed. I don't know that it's the whole solution. I yeah. just wanted to ask about Okay, great. So I think the question that I hear here is what has actually happened maybe since this has been revitalized in Pennsylvania, what actually happens and what's happening in other places where these laws are on the books? Does it remedy the whole? Does that remedy some of the problems that we're talking about? Yeah, so let me take a couple of other questions. Yes. Uh, the last speaker uh, said that uh, this amendment would not uh, deter bad actors. The problem is that the totality of our economy is a bad actor which is threatening the long-term survival of civilization as we know it. Uh, that's liable to uh, the continuing business as usual will lead Superstorm Sandy was a unique event, but the scientific projections are that such events could occur in the New York metro area uh, by 2030 every five years or so, and by the end of the century, maybe annually. Uh, Elizabeth Colbert uh, wrote a book, The Sixth Extinction, which is in progress. The fifth extinction wiped out the dinosaurs and the majority of life on Earth. Uh, the environment is not an amenity. It is a survival necessity for billions of people. We've got to treat it like that. We need a political climate change and enacting an amendment like this in the process of enacting an amendment like this can be part of a political climate we need to transform our economy uh, to be compatible with the long term survival. Thank you. One more and then we'll. Um, so what I'm hearing is that this amendment is not a solution. And I'm wondering if it's intended to be a solution or if it's intended to be another tool in the toolbox. Um, and if it's intended to be another tool, which would be my interpretation of, of what it is, because when all you have is a hammer, then everything has to be a nail. And maybe we need some other tools. How the addition of this tool would address some of those may be impossible. Like, if we struck down everything that may be impossible, we'd be absolutely nowhere. And so I think that's exactly why you put another tool in place. So I'm wondering if there's a, uh, you know, an answer to that. I don't think this is intended to be a solution, and I'd like to maybe hear a little bit more about that. OK, great. So why don't you mind starting, and then we can maybe go through. Sure, honestly, we go the other way. Go the other way. Sure. And I can be sure. <laughs> I'm happy to try to add to the conversation, and the idea that a, um, a constitutional amendment would somehow be um, a guide, but not binding, is I think what some people are suggesting, and how can it occur. Um, as a policy statement, it's probably consistent with a policy statement you can find in many, many statutes and in the New York State Constitution. And I don't leave it to Darren to describe the potential to have chilling effects on other aspects of, of our economic activity. So, you know, in New York State, the reality is we compete for jobs, we compete for opportunities, and if it's seen as a place where the rights and risks of doing business are unsettled and uncertain, there are consequences. Now, they may be, they may be necessary, I agree. And I, I agree very much. The hour is late. I was you were very right about that. But um, I, I just want to make sure that we, that we deliberate and balance the two competing concerns. So, um, yeah, going back to it, in terms of the tool, it's a tool which has consequences. It's a tool which we you know, you utilize, we don't know what. And my, you know, my, you know, my preference would be can we sort of see those issues be addressed in the legislative matter. There are specific concerns regarding the way uh, the way we're handling either, you know, if there's cancer clusters that people are aware are concerned about. There have actually been opportunities for both uh, the legislature to pass legislation, but also too is 
individual uh, legislators otherwise to say, you know, we need additional funding for the Department of Health. The Department of Health does basically cancer cluster research and they'll actually invest in the research in that area. They go out and they sample the individuals. Uh, you know, they can go ahead and see what's occurring. In all those cases, that we're reacting to something that has already happened. And so I think that, and that's the real concern that I have with this, is that he is reacting to something. Even all those are reacting to something that happened. We need to basically make sure we're a deterrent for something in the future, and it doesn't work. And that's one of the problems that I have. But the other two is, and you know, you'd ask about the tool, what's the deterrent individuals from making investments in a different way of being deterrent? And with those different investments would be the investments we'd like to see. So sometimes it's going to be solar. And solar needs to have basically process we've already seen on Long Island where, where individuals and, and basically a community outgrows uh, and they basically they tank the solar problem. We've seen it happen now numerous times with wind, it was probably in, it was in my slides, which would have showed you about uh, numerous wind projects that have already basically been uh, taken out. And they've been because of community opposition to them. Now they would help the benefit us as a society as a whole but the individuals that are expressly living in that, in that area are really concerned. Not to say that they don't have value and those, and those voices should be listened to. Maybe they weren't the right projects, but the more uncertainty it basically is in terms of the development of that project, the less likely it's going to happen. And this will be a layer of uncertainty that will be added on that project, which is, right now, we wouldn't know what it would be like, but the courts intervene in such a way we can see that none of this can be built. The problem being is we're not going to need our, our greenhouse gas goals without basically something happening. Now, there's a sort of a view about the world where we can sort of exist in this world where we can't basically nothing will be affected in an adverse way. It's just unfortunate. There is a, basically, it's, there's a rule in physics which is everything is interconnected to the gravitational pull. It is the same in the ecology, which is you do one thing and it will have another effect. You could do the best, the best thing to do with you without an adverse There's some failure to But in this instance, the court is there to make sure that the benefits are being taken into account and that the benefits are being taken into account and that the benefits are being taken into account and that the benefits are being taken into account and that the benefits are being taken into account and that the benefits are being taken into account and that the so they're going to look at something specific. But, but then it's their job to look at that, isn't it? No. It depends on how it comes forth. It really depends on what the court chooses to, to decide. But you can look. This is, I mean, but it's, it's really, it's, but right. you're making a, like, you're making this sort of false, this false equivalency that if we have a constitution, that we're, the courts are going to go down this path. All the laws are going to go by the wayside. I'm not saying, 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 saying all the laws are going by the wayside. It's just, it's a false no, equivalency. Just the laws get interpreted, yes. right, through yes. appropriate interpretation. There's lots of, of, of guidance for the courts to use to apply and how you interpret a law, how you apply a law in this context. This, in, in this it's context. not the same. And you have the same. It's not the same. You have right? the it's same under the Constitution. The courts have many layers of guidance for how you interpret and, and apply constitutional language, even broad constitutional language. And most language, most constitutional provisions in the Bill, Bill of Rights sections of constitutions actually are broad. And to suggest that the New York uh, judiciary is going to be incapable of interpreting and, and applying this constitutional provision when Montana and Pennsylvania are actually doing it very capably to import the fact. Yes, as we, as we saw. Now, if you want to take one horror picture here and there and say, oh my God, something horrible happened in Pennsylvania and Montana, so therefore that, that bill of uh, environmental rights amendment is of no good. Of horribles. That is not that that in and of itself is not evidence that it does or does not work. So that's it's just it, it makes you yeah. sort of a false assertion based on one photo. Can I ask it's not fair. Can I ask yes, you can, can, an example of how that's been interpreted in the way that it's been productive from your point of view, and then I'll give you a chance to respond. To that. In in how the constitutional yes. rights in other states have been interpreted in ways that have actually been productive. So we can get a feel of how yes. that's not being interpreted in crazy ways, but ways that are actually.
actually useful for addressing some of these yeah. issues. So, well, we, I mean, we first off, we do have the Act 13, which I've gone through. There's um, another uh, successful case that went up to the um, Pennsylvania Supreme Court. There you had a situation where um, the Pennsylvania legislature had made an ill-informed decision to allow, and the governor's office, to allow the leasing of um, state-owned lands for fracking. There were lease payments, and those lease payments were being co-opted for the general budget. Because of the, the way the Pennsylvania Constitution was framed, there was a challenge on sort of the co-opting of that money for just the general operations of the state. It's a little bit, right, there's, as with everything in the law, there are some complications, but essentially, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court came back and said, look, you are um, getting those monies because you are leasing the use of the, and degradation of the natural resources of the Pennsylvania uh, state-owned lands. Those, therefore, those funds must come back into what's called the trust, the protection of the natural resources, which are the trust, um, in the trust, and once the trust resources that the government is supposed to protect by virtue of the way Pennsylvania's environmental rights amendment is written. And so you have to use those funds to protect and restore natural resources. In the case of the Bishop Tube site, that highly toxic site that's been sitting there for 30 years with this contamination plume spreading, the government not focused at all on cleaning up the site, but actually focused on how to develop the site with residential housing while the TCE would remain in the groundwater and in the soils of the site. There, there, the Green Amendment is being used to say um, that the government officials have a duty, have a duty to act to restore the site and restore the environmental um, resources that are at that site. They can't just leave the toxic contamination in place in a way that's endangering people, health, welfare, and the environment. Um, we have other situations where there has been permitting for the spreading of sewage sludge or the approval of a CAFO. And when the residents came to challenge the, the, the granting of the permit, they were able to make the case that, the, and the government officials acknowledge this, that the government officials did not look at the actual ramifications of allowing the spreading of the sewage sludge or the permitting of the CAFO in that location. They didn't look at the facts. They didn't look at the impacts for the environment or the local residents. They didn't look at the science. And when you brought forth the public record, it was demonstrated that essentially they checked the boxes of the regulations, but they didn't actually look at what would be the ramifications of putting this operation in this location in the way it's being proposed. And there the court said, you need to go back and you need to look at the facts, the impacts, and the science before you decide. And the case was referred back for detailed and thoughtful decision making and consideration before approval. And those now more thoughtful considerations are happening. Right? So it plays out in a lot of different way, ways, but it's all about how do you protect the environment and advance your goals at the same time, and how do you make sure that you're doing it in a thoughtful way that's genuinely thinking about the ramifications of what you're going to do, where you're going to do it. Okay, great. Let me get a response from you, and if you could be concrete about some of the concerns that you have. I know it's harder with something that's future-oriented, and I hear that there are these concerns about how these uh, issues might have environmental, uh, sorry, economic impact or impacts on businesses. Could you, yeah, if you could have a response? Sure. I would like to say that uh, the basic question you describe the circumstances where individuals believe that their government really hasn't done what they should have done to protect them. Now, there is a uh, very certain point, of course, in the state of New York for uh, such items. Now, it is clear that in environmental conservation law, that there is basically that already the state has uh, an obligation to protect human health and the environment. And they are obligated to do that. So that's already an obligation. There is basically a process. People are permitted to issue in a way that's inconsistent or you know, just find that they basically are falsely or not printing in a proper manner or way. There's an article 78 proceeding that can go through the process and basically see the appeal. Prior to even that, there is much, there is significant opportunity to, to, for individuals to, to provide them through the secret process, through the actual permitting process, the, going out to 
potentially sitting before an ALJ and having the ALJ an opportunity to review the individual environmental standards on those individual projects. In each of those cases that you've described, everything could have been basically handled in that similar way that is already in existence. The advantage of something which is already in existence is we know how the process works. There is certainty. There are rules. The certainty and those rules provide us with an understanding as to how that will happen. There are also, in those circumstances, we're dealing specifically with government actors. When we talk about environmental bill of rights, we're no longer limiting our discussion that individual government actors being basically perpetrating the issue we can have individuals claiming basically a harm from another individual. And that's where things can get seriously awry. And that, in terms of real concerns, would be if somebody was looking to make an investment in a facility in the state of New York, let's say they employ thousands of people and they're looking to make an upgrade to that, that, that location. And they have facilities throughout the entire world. And they, they, people, they employ people here, they do good things here, but as a byproduct of that production of that, of that place, and there are some things that as a result of the byproduct of the place that, that are being produced and the things that we need, that actually may actually help us to make sure that we meet our environmental objectives, that there, there are emissions associated with and they can occur here, they make an investment, they occur here, or they occur elsewhere. If they occur here, which means we get to control, we get to go through our government process, we get to go through, through basically Article 78, the public gets an opportunity to have input into it, and we get the best product we get out of that process. That's the intent. If it goes elsewhere, we don't know what's going to happen. When we live in a global environment, I think we certainly have to recognize that, that investment can occur very easily outside of our shores. And every time we create uncertainty, we create the opportunity to go over. Now, I'm not saying we should go to the least common denominator and all of those issues we have to throw back, but the issue is, it is true. Uncertainty will kill the projects. So, so, I, I, don't, so I, I, don't, I don't feel like that. I, yeah, what I said to me, I don't feel like I have a constituency in this precise way. And, and it's absolutely clear that the river keeper has been a very effective advocate. Because when you find a constitutional principle that has been dormant for 42 years and can successfully use it, that is something that should be applauded. There's no question about it. That is an excellent use of the tool. But I can tell you what I do tell my clients on a routine basis. When you litigate an issue, you give up control. Somebody else decides, yeah, a judge. Okay, when you engage, and I believe that means in a regulatory executive process, you have a voice, and it's, it's, that's the difference. I think that's the, the, the balance that has to be struck here. And a couple of people have asked the question, does it have to be mutually exclusive? No, I, I don't believe it does. I don't believe it does. But, but as Darren said, there are, uh, there are outcomes, there are consequences from both of them. So anyway, yeah. the question is, who gets to this option? that natural gas is clean. And so they have this false analogy where they say, well, we're doing environmental advocacy and part of the solution is natural gas, which we know is methane and a high contributor to greenhouse gases. So part of the problem is we have people in place who have 20th century engineering knowledge and don't know what's possible in the 21st century. So you sit down with an expert like J.A. who knows what can be done in terms of geothermal and people are still dealing with combined heat and power stuff. So I think in terms of setting a standard for what's acceptable, um, it may not be perfect, but it's good to have a standard that says environmental uh, rights are fundamental human rights. And it's possible that industry can figure out a way of using that as a fig leaf to defend bad action. But I don't know if that should be a reason not to have a vision. Okay, thank you. I'm going to take, oh, we have now lots of questions. Oh, <laughs> 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 if you could be brief as 
Yeah. So first off, a, a green amendment does offer certainty. It helps offer certainty in how the existing laws on the books are implemented, right? In, in that they have to be implemented in a way that keeps in mind the right to a healthy environment and puts those rights on par with, for example, the private property rights that industry and developers often use to try to advance their arguments, their cause, um, and, and their goals. So it starts to offer more certainty to the people in uh, ensuring that their rights are going to be part of the priority. The kinds of process and procedures you talked about in New York, and I have worked in New York for many, many years, 25 years, as well as New Jersey, Delaware, and Pennsylvania. The same kinds of processes we actually have in these other states, right? But again, that process often can fall down on the jobs when you don't have the right priority vision, when the state legislators don't understand what is what are that um, the right to clean water, clean air, and healthy the environment are amongst their guiding principles that have to be used in the implementation of that process. Judges, they have an important role, right? They've always had an important role. Look at the civil rights movement, right? Yes, it was judges that helped restore, right, fundamental rights um, in terms of civil rights when they were overlooked and misapplied for so many years by so many government officials. So judges have an important role to play in our legal system and have throughout uh, throughout its history. Um, and I just want to note that another thing that the uh, Green Amendment does for you is when you have a gap in the law, like when you have no regulation for PFCs, for example, that um, are devastating uh, people's drinking water supplies, a Green Amendment right, can become a gap filler for all those places and spaces where you don't have a law in place, giving certainty to the people who are at risk of losing their lives that government officials, even in the absence can and will and are empowered to take action on their behalf for their protection and their benefit, not just the profit and economic goals of industry, which all has you know too much of a heavy hand uh, in this day and age already. So I'm going to take a round of questions. I'm going to ask you to please be brief because we may not have a chance actually for a response to that. So any kind of question? Um, no, Gary, was more of a comment. I guess when I look at the slides of the environment will not be better off. And I, I look at this issue it's coming from different angles. So what Maya said is that none of this is talking about removing or reversing the environmental laws that all serve an incredibly important purpose, purpose in terms of regulating what has happened, the pollution consequences, the permitting. Um, I'm thinking about it in terms of this preventative framework, which is where you know this Green Amendment can fill that gap. Um, and I think there is a lot to be said about thinking about environmentalism environmental law and regulation in the preventative focus. I mean, I, not to bring my personal, but I've worked in Australia for eight years, and we recently just completely rewrote the entire environmental statute book from a preventative focus model versus pollution command and control. So I don't, you know, I understand the challenges that, you know, of the certainty for business and business, but I think in this day and age, we're still seeing a tremendous amount of degradation to the environment, health clusters, I mean, it's no good just dealing with dealing with the regulatory process of dealing with cancer clusters, once they're there, the whole point is to prevent them from happening in the first place. Um, and so I, I guess I just wanted to make that comment that I see this as kind of, a, there's two angles to environmental um, regulation of law, which is pre pollution prevent, like prevention and um, addressing the issue. Yes. If someone who's been fighting these battles at a very local community level, we need an equalizer. There's so much more money. My community is a community where they're looking to put an Amazon warehouse. There's a nearby neighborhood that's having to raise tens of thousands of dollars for trying to fight, fend off an Amazon warehouse over our town's aquifer. There's all kinds of bad reasons why it shouldn't be there. We wouldn't even, the town wouldn't even do a full EIS on this facility, which is a million square feet. We need something in our constitution that helps to equalize its business. Council has hundreds of thousands of dollars to push for what it wants to see for New York State. As individuals, as organizations, we don't have the monetary resources that big business has to thrust these things on us, and we have to try and battle back against them. We need a constitutional amendment that would give us some strength and some ability to stand up against these things without needing to have tons and tons of monetary resources to do that. Um, uh, my organization, Interfaith Impact, and uh, 
we are strongly in favor of this measure because we see it as environmental stewardship for our future generations, for grandchildren, great grandchildren. We need a simple statement that provides a rock upon which to look around and do all of the other specifics that they're talking about here. This, this, this amendment cuts through every single one of these. And that's what we need. We need a simple statement. Remember, New York hasn't had one. Aaron Burr got a franchise to ship polluted water throughout New York State, or New York City. And what happened? Well, he made a lot of money after. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's like it ended up in a duel with Hamilton. There, we need so we need to get get past this this Hamilton uh, Burr kind of stuff and get get with a a vision that makes it possible for us all to ensure that our grandchildren, our great grandchildren, have a leg to stand on. I would like to see a body of case law develop over the generation to deal with all of the stuff that uh, the business council is concerned about. And you get it absolutely right that it's heart, it's mind. It's the, it's, the, it's the vision, and that's why we're in favor. Thank you. I'm going to take two more. Yes. I just want to make a comment in response to something that I believe you said about Acoustic Falls and as a process that governs these sort of things. We'll say a little bit about the Acoustic Falls case, and uh, in the year that it took for them to issue an official warning that the water was not safe to drink, well, they were going all over all this between the city government and the company involved in the state government. People were still drinking polluted water, contaminated water. So even if they get a big monetary settlement from that case, people are still drinking that water for years and years, and that doesn't change the fact that there's going to be huge rates of cancer, there's going to be higher rates of disease in that community. So it's, it's not like this process is perfect already. You need to have some basic sort of that. I, I, mean, I didn't think the process was perfect. I understand exactly what happened in terms of how the Department of Health and basically what those levels were. I'm not sure, you know, quite honestly, they're talking about parts per trillion parts per billion, the representative in there, the folks at DOH were trying to make the best decision for the health of the individuals in Usyk. The individuals that were there in Usyk, they represented, they chose not to communicate now to, to, their, to their constituency. There's a lot that happened there. There's a lot of opportunity to look at uh, kind of emerging contaminants and what they mean. But I think when it comes down to it in terms of what level was or wasn't acceptable to be basically a contaminant in the water, and that's you know that was that was at the heart of, of the issue. This bill, this sort of environmental right, doesn't won't change that, and that it's, it's no, not no, no, it really won't. Do you yeah, think the DOH, you think DOH basically was sitting there in the room and they said, you know what, we're going to only we're not going to do anything because we don't have an environmental right or individual. No, it right. does Do you think that they basically consciously it allowed? It wasn't right? only do you think does that, absolutely. I'm going to take one more question and then we can wrap up the comments from everyone. Oh, Zach, you're yeah. having <laughs> Jennifer. Sorry, so Zach, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I think I hear, hear what you're saying, Darren, um, in that, you know, something like this might give fodder for the opponents to projects. And another avenue, you know, like Article 10, was something that was supported by environmental groups and is now being used against developing projects. Um, do I have that right? Is that kind of, yeah. you're saying it's going to prevent projects from being built. Right. And that's that's your concern is that it would give kind of more, it would actually give tools to the opposition. It potentially, it did. Potentially it's one of the options, yeah. And I mean, do you think there's any credence to the argument? There is this provision in Article 10 that allows the state to override. Um, and but there seems to be a lack of impetus from the state to use that override. And I think a lot of people think maybe something like this might might be that tool for the state to say, okay, in order to the state doesn't believe that they actually they have not in part chose to override, and it's their own choice. But you know, attorneys from the Public Service Commission have expressed doubt about how they can. So right, and I think something like this would probably help neutral, 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 neutralize that. Process, process. That I think very few people sort of. Yeah, I mean, you guys can maybe connect on that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to just ask one I final do. comment from all of our panels and then we'll wrap up if that's okay. So we'll start with you again in the Yeah, so I look, uh, my, my perspective on the Green Amendment is that it's a choice about where decisions get made. And, uh, you know, should they be made by genuine 
Judges, judges who have no particular grounding in science or policy, or should they be made by executive agencies with that presumed expertise in those areas? Neither process will be perfect. Perfection is not what we should be you know, striving for. The question is what will be the most efficient process and what will provide the best outcome for us to what you want to achieve. Yeah, I mean, I guess I see this constitutional provision, like any other, it could be foundational in terms of bolstering other specific litigation based on legislation. So I mean, I think this sets a standard by which a deviation can be argued is deleterious. So, you know, maybe there are some unforeseen consequences, but I don't think we should make the perfect enemy of the good. I think that it's necessary to have every possible tool, and, and I, I see more positive than any possible negative for or amending the Constitution to make, you know, a, a, a sustainable environment of basic human rights. So, uh, perhaps, uh, but what Ed had indicated, and they had to obviously have a real concern about, and you know, this much authority to the judiciary. But honestly, we want to be engaged in the development of solutions to environmental, real environmental challenges. The environmental challenge we have, which is the very present, which is uh, climate change, the solutions are not going to be perceived as a result of additional litigation. They're going to be a result of the change in the way that our society basically exists. We're going to have to change the way that we're using our resources, and we're going to have to change the way that those resources uh, are, are going to be utilized in a variety of different ways. But, and our hope is, quite honestly, we can engage in discussion regarding those issues. We can develop policy solutions that are done. We've done it in other areas. We certainly have the ability to do it, and it makes more sense. Um, if you believe that you have a right to clean water, clean air, a stable climate, and healthy environment, that that's your fundamental right, then you should support including that right in the Bill of Rights section of the state constitution, along with all of the, the statement of all of the other human rights, political rights, and civil rights that you hold dear, that I hold dear, that we as a, as a community and as a nation hold dear, including civil rights provisions, right? Including due process provisions, including free speech provisions, and all of those other fundamental freedoms in the Bill of Rights sections of our state and federal constitutions have secured fundamentally important protections for communities and people across the history of the United States of America. Judges don't always get it right, but if we have it in the Bill of Rights section, we always have the opportunity right, to turn that around and make sure they get it right for posterity and for history. And the fact of the matter is, if there's a lawsuit that's grounded in the Green Amendment that prevents some bad project, then it was a bad project that should have been prevented because it put at risk somebody's access to clean water, clean air, and a healthful environment. So it's an important tool that complements everything we have. It doesn't displace it, but it's also an umbrella, umbrella tool, and it, is, it adds an incredible level of power and strength and importance, particularly in those instances when you have a gap in protection. So I just say, if you believe in your heart, you should be able to go to the faucet and get a glass of water and believe that it's free of dangerous toxins that could give you, your child, or your friend, or your family member cancer, then you should support adding that to the Bill of Rights section of your state constitution. All right, that's a good place to end.